Okay, we're recording the session. Good evening, everybody. My name is Yelena, and I'm going to be the Watson Analytics System Administrator. And that's an application that you're going to use for many assignments of this course. And tonight, we're going to do the introductory session. So here is an agenda for today. We're going to talk what, what, what I'm going to explain what Watson Analytics is, and I'll show you what you need to do to get started. We're going to talk about the three Ds, which is Watson Analytics Workflow. We're going to talk about refining data, natural language question, the models, how to save your work, and more. And pay very close attention, because throughout the sessions, also I'm not going to explicitly say this is an answer to the uh, Watson Analytics 101 course test question, but you'll hear the answers during the presentation. All right. So. First of all, to get a big picture, what is Watson Analytics? The whole idea is that, suppose that we don't know how to program, right? What we want to do is we want to get insight from our data without writing any code. I should be able to import my data in, and I should be able to ask my questions in a human language, and I should be able to get my answer, right? So there should be no, or little or no learning curve, and you just can you can just get your findings about the data and you can put it together in a nice display, infographics, and create a storybook, right? So it should be really user-friendly. Uh, now, I guess we're going to start from some very good news. Uh, our data analytics students, they won the global Watson Analytics competition two years in a row. So that's basically when you have participants from all over the world Australia, Canada, and etc. So what I did, guys, this is for you. I put together those links to their work so that you can look at like this set example. And if you're interested, let us know. Perhaps we'll have, we'll have another competition next year, and you can participate, right? So this is some good news. All right, so let's get back to the business. This is a brief history. Uh, Watson Analytics was developed by IBM. If you may remember, back in 2011, there was a Jeopardy game where the computer named Watson beat the top two contestants. So that set the stage. The Jeopardy game set the stage for Watson Analytics application, so to speak. And here I put a couple links to the articles. Oh, how do you sign up for what? Oh, for the competition? Oh, that's an excellent question. It's going to be next year, and there will be an announcement. Next year, when we do a competition, there will be an announcement. Promi I promise. It will be in the classroom. All right? So now let's continue. Okay, excellent. So what, we're gonna, what you need to do is, this weekend, I send you, I send you an invitation. Uh, for this, for the assignment in this course, you have to use an account under my subscription for numerous reasons. It's because we will we'll be sharing files with the team for the last assignment. It's because we'll be using some functionalities that are only available in a professional version. So what I did was, over the weekend, I created your accounts. So if you had not had a chance to do that after this session, after this session, right, go back to your email, and I used your email in Leo, and check for an invitation and accept it. Uh, more likely, well, sometimes it's highly possible that invitation went to spam. So make sure to check your spam mail. Okay? If you did not receive an invitation, then this is my contact number. We'll need to walk through it. Okay? So, and this is, okay, this is the first part. The second part of what you need to do, you need to take the self-paced course and uh, over the weekend, I put together a nice recording on how to uh, navigate through the course, and it's in the classroom, right? And I put together some uh, tips, how to check your progress, and so on. So this is a course you need to take. So here, this link is to the course, and this link is to the recording, YouTube recording on how to, on what you need to do to, to take this class. Now, uh, you need to accept an invitation only once. After that, this is a login page into Watson Analytics, so it may help if you just bookmark this, right? Uh, on, on your next time, this is what you do. 
you go, you click on the sign in, sign in at the top, and you'll be prompted for your RBM ID. So your RBM ID is an email address where you received an invitation, and a password is a password that you set, right, when you accepted an invitation. So you want to remember that password is case sensitive, right? For any reason, if you forget your password, once you enter your IBM ID, you go into see this forgot link, right? So that's where you click if you don't remember your password, right? You can do the password reset. Okay. Now, and I'm going to start sharing my screen shortly. So this is a landing page. This is how it looks like when you log in. And I put some notes in there. But let me go ahead and start sharing the screen. So we be go in between slides and a, and a uh, application. So let me do that. And I have a copy of the slides saved, saved on my uh, PC as well. So I'm going to share my screen right now. And here is an application. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. It's because I need to share. Okay, I see what I did. There we go. This is what you will see. I'm right now. I'm logged in with the same privileges as your account is, right? Because for this purpose of demonstration, I don't want to be logged in as admin. I don't want to confuse you. So when you log in, you might see some of the data sets, right? I have to refresh. Okay. You might see some of the data sets, right? Uh, because whenever you accepted Watson Analytics invitation. You had an option to choose some data sets from the sample, right? So here's my landing page. Look, uh, this is the workflow. This is data, right? That's the tab where you're going to upload your data. Discover tab is where you will build your models. Uh, display tab is where you will put together a nice story about the data. Here, I see two folders. One folder is called personal. Another folder is called shared. And I put together another video on how to use the data sets that I uploaded to the shared area. And I believe it's in the classroom. So personal is is a data that's visible to me. Shared is what's, what's shared with me. You will see these two folders. And I put together a nice video on what's in each folder and how to use it. Right? Okay. So now I'm going to go back to my personal area. And we're going to... Uh, talk about agent data. So just keep in mind the workflow. You've got you've got the data, right? And then you're going to build some models on your data, and then we have to present our findings, right? So this is a landing page. That's what you just saw, and I need to point out a few things that it may sound very easy, but this is important. Take a look at this. So here are my data sets, and uh, I can. Look at the. I can look at it in the tile mode, and I can look at it in the list mode. This is how I switch, right? List versus tiles. Here I have an option to sort my data. Take a look at it. I can sort them by data set name. I can sort it by date when it was last modified. I can sort it by data quality and type. Okay. There is no sort option such as owner, right? These four are the available options. Just remember that. All right. So uh, now take a look at it. This is a data set. Data quality is displayed here, right? And what is this? Watson Analytics is analyzing every single column in the data that you upload, and it's looking at the skewness. It's looking at the, if there are missing values, and based on that, it determines the overall score, right? So now let's discuss this in more details. Uh, here, very important. You're going to forget about the existence of the browser back button, okay? Because the, there are unpredictable behaviors. So you're not going to use the back button. Instead, you're going to use this menu. And if you notice that, uh, whatever is displayed in this menu, it means that I have a file open. Okay, so now remember that even if I log out, even if I log out, if I left the file open, it remains open, right? So whenever I open something, it's going to be listed in here, right? So you want to use the menu instead of the back button. That's it. Okay, now 
What else you can see is on every single page you have this question mark that's a help menu. And I really love this documentation. You just click here, right? It, it's broken down into sections. I can click on the data and take a look at that. It's going to give me nice documentation. It really, it's very updated and I can search for what I need or I can just read. Right? If I'm new, I can just read. Uh, what else you have? You have access to community pages and a get it started tutorial and the tour. Right? So basically tour is just going to show you it's just going to show you what you are looking at, right? It's just gonna show you what different buttons mean buttons mean. Okay, so now let's move on. Let's uh, here is the workflow and what you need to know is what each tile at the top does. So data allows you adding data, refining data, and uh, you may also um, move data. You can organize data in the folders, and you may delete and so on. That's what data does. Discover allows building the model, and uh, you can do the multi-tab visualizations. For instance, the pie charts, bar plots, and the uh, Display, you can build a multi-tab dashboard view or an infographic, and you can create an expert storybook to communicate your findings, right? That's basically what it is. Now, there are many ways to add data, and uh, you will watch the video recording on how to use data sets that in, are in a shared folder. Uh, in addition to the data sets that I uploaded to the shared folder, Watson Analytics comes with a pre-installed data sets and they're located in the sample data. This is pre-installed. So if I want to add something to my personal area, I could just select and click import, right? I could do that. Ultimately, I could import the files from my hard drive. To do that, I would just click on br and browse and to find and find my file. Or I can just do this. I can find my file and do drag and drop. Now, very important. I can, if I want to, I can import multiple files at the same time, just by dragging and drag and click, click and browse. If I do that, I will see a new file added for each tile that I import, okay? Whenever I upload more than one file at the same time, I will see a little tile added for each data separately. So I'm going to click on import right now, right? Uh, there we go. And what it's doing right now, it's looking at the data. It's looking at the relationships among the columns in my spreadsheet. So now what's happening is this. My file, my data file has more than one tab. And I'm prompted which tab I want to read and which tab I want to load. So uh, here, this is the only question that I'm going to explicitly tell you the answer right now. Uh, at the time when the test was created, uh, only one sheet could be uploaded. It would upload just the first one without prompting, right? So on the test, it is a question. Answer that uh, only the first sheet gets imported. In reality, now I have a choice. Right? I can choose in reality. But let's do sheet one and do confirm, right? It's because the reason I was prompted is that my my data set, my data set was, uh, it had multiple tabs. My file has multiple tabs. It's still processing. So because if I go in here and if I open the file in Excel, that I'll see it. Okay, oops. That's a tracking file. Okay, there we go. It's going to open up, and I will show you what I mean. But while we're looking at that, so let me see. Here it is. So what I did was, on this slide here, I summarized right, how to upload the file. And later, on the next slide, there are some rules that your data, that the data must follow in order to, be, in order to work in, a, in a, uh, Watson Analytics. First of all, the data that you upload has to be a table. It has to be a structural format. 
you have to have the columns. The columns should be should have a name. Every column should have a name. The names need to be intuitive, very descriptive, and uh, you have must have at least one numeric column. And uh, you make sure that the values in the same column have the same data type, right? And the one row represents a specific record, and you cannot have empty columns. And make sure that the file it does not have a, is not password protected. So just to illustrate what I mean, here are some examples of the problems. Here, the first example, the problem is you cannot have this format in the colors and the drop-down list. You cannot have this as a problem in the first one. The second example, the columns A1, A2, A3 are not intuitive. I cannot say what, what drives my A4, for instance, right? It does not really make sense. Uh, here, the problem is in age. Uh, in some records, I keep a number. In another records, I keep teenager. This is inconsistent. I should do either adult teenager child or keep the numbers or keep the numeric values, right? That's what it is. Okay, here it is. See this? This is the data. And, well, there are some problems in here. Some Somehow, button analytics still took it. But I recommend removing all of these drop-downs, removing all formatting, right? But in general, there are two tabs in here, see this? I have two tabs, and I decided to upload the first tab for analysis. This data set tracks the student's academic performance, including the GPA number of absences, if a student is a club member and a student country state. And here is, this column means if a student is at academic risk, right? So perhaps you wanted, it would be interesting to see which factors uh, could tell that the student might be at risk, right? Those things. Those are the questions that you may want to ask about your data. But before we do that, we have to look at the refinement, right? So we look at that, right? Uh, this is an error, this is a message this is an error message that I would have received if I already had a file with the same name, right? So if you attempt to upload the file with the same name, this is the error that you would receive. So remember that slide, right? I tried to show you examples of the errors, right? So this is a menu of this style, right? So if we look at it, at the risk student style, if I click here, it's opening up the menu. Uh, refine means that I want to define some filters on my data, or I can add the new columns, calculated columns. Uh, don't worry about an append and replace at the moment. Export basically allows me to download the data uh, to my hard drive. Well, sometimes I, I want to do that if I made some manipulation, right? Sometimes if I made some changes. And if I want to take that and analyze it in another program, that's one example. Uh, rename, it means that I can change the name of the file. Move, well, basically, you would use it, well, sometimes you want to uh, create a bunch of folders and organize your work in the folders, right? You can move it in the folder. And move is also useful when on your last assignment, when you start sharing data with your teammates. But... I'm going, I promise, I'm going to show you that when we come to it, during that part of the semester. And delete, but when you delete something, I want you to keep in mind that there is no recycle bin. So delete cannot be undone, right? And this one is going to show me the data inf asset information, right? So it showed me when I, att when I attempted to upload the file, I received an error. I had to choose the tabs that I wanted to use. And this is a file size. And this is the time when I uploaded it and who uploaded it. This information is available only for the data set. It's not available for the workbooks that you create, right? So now, in order to actually view the data and to refine it, I would have to click on ellipses. And remember, I have to select refine, OK? So what does it do? It opens the data in a tabular view. It's somewhat similar to what we looked at in a minute ago, right? It's going to be similar. The first row will have the column headings, and the rest of the rows are going to be data. So right now it's loading. It depends on the bandwidth, and it depends on uh, the internet connection speed. But here, the bandwidth is a factor, because 
I'm using this, right? I'm using an application while I'm uh, sharing the screen. Okay, so here's my data, right? This is this is this are the column headings, and uh, here are some menus some to talk about. When I click here, this is a list of my columns, and I can check and check, right? I can check and check the columns that I want to be used as part of my visualization. Why would I do that? Uh, sometimes I want to create a different copy of the file uh, for different line of business, perhaps, right? For instance, there could be line of business where I don't that I don't want to see how much the student paid, right? So I would probably save this file as a copy and remove the fields that I don't want the person to see. So you can hide show, right? Uh, you do that by just uh, uh, clicking and unclicking. You can click and unclick. This is how you show hide. Oops. Now I don't like what I just did. So this button is my friend. I can just click on this button and it will undo the change, right? So this button is going to be your best friend. Okay, redo and undo, right? Remember, I cannot delete the, the, the file, but I can, un, uh, I can undo something that I don't want to, something that I did not do, right? I want, I can undo it here. Okay, so let me go ahead, click here. Click in here again, it, it should close this menu. Uh, this one is a data quality score, and it will show me the quality score for each a column. But I want you to know that uh, on my sample, I have everybody from New York. So it will not give me the data quality score for the state column. Oops, it's taking all the while to load. But for the state column, I'm not going to get the data quality score. It's because of... Uh, I have a single value throughout the whole data. For the county, uh, Watson analytic will, uh, Analytics will read it as a unique identifier because I have, well, here it is, whenever I have more than 50 values, it will read, Watson Analytics will interpret the variable as a unique identifier. That's the reason it says unique. It's because I have more than 50 counties in, in my data. Okay? So keep this in mind. Okay, here it is. This is, this one, it shows high quality because the, the data, the variable is, how do you say it, balanced, right? If the variable is cubed, the data quality score is lower, okay? Uh, if, it's, if, if the data quality is high, it means that my variable distribution is closer to normal and there are no uh, missing values, okay? In this case, there are no missing values, actually. I'm just familiar with the data. Okay, so and you can keep scrolling through to see all the columns, right? Some of the columns are numeric and some of the columns are categorical, also called nominal. You'll find it differently in in the text in different textbooks. So now let's continue here. So this here, I kind of like briefly des described this interface that we just looked at. Uh, here, let's look at the column, let's look at the properties. So let me go back. And when I click on my column, perhaps this is a change of GPA. And, uh, well, this field, in this case, it's a categorical, negative, positive, and no change, right? So I could do this. I could click here. And when I do that, this is I can see my properties. And the properties are usually the data type, and then I could specify if I want my column to be included when I build the model, right? That's called the driver. If I want my column to be the default target, well, probably not this one, right? Okay, and I can also choose to sort. I can choose to sort. And also, I could make my column ordinal, right? And for this specific column, it makes sense, actually, because... The negative change, no change in positive change, it could be ordinal, right? If I wanted to uh, to do that, I can. And this piece here, it will make much more sense when we do the groups. If I try to show perhaps the counts, right? When I try to show how many people had a positive change in the GPA by this county, perhaps, right? Uh, here, in this case, it's doing count distinct. I probably want to change by count. Right.
Okay, so let me close this for right now. Right, yes. And to see, uh, actually, to see if I wanted to see the next one, next field, I can just click on the arrow to see the property of the next field. Right? Or I can just close this and then click on the headings. Well, usually it's faster, but since I'm sharing my screen right now, there is a little bit delay in the response. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, so now I need. there are several things that I need to show you, right? And several things are very important. So I showed you the data quality score, right? But there is something very important, and something works differently for numeric values and categorical values. Take a look at this first. I can filter my data, right? When I when the variable is categorical, look at this. Right now, by default, it's including all values. I can do this. When I do this, perhaps fourth quartile, I'm only selecting the students with the fourth quartile, right? Or what I could do also to select everything but fourth quartile, I can do the in word. I can do in word, right? That should select everything else besides what I already had selected. Or I can do the clear. Clear will uh, remove the filter that I just defined. Okay. okay, it will respond. Okay, so now do you remember this friend here? We can do undo. If I did something that I did not really want to do, I can do this. I can do undo. Okay, if my variable is numeric, I cannot do this. I cannot pick the values that I want to use. Uh, instead, there is a slider, and I have to use the slider to select the range. See this? So this is one difference between the numeric variable and categorical variable. Uh, what I also could do is I could build, I could create a calculation. And calculation is nothing but new column, right? Remember this, the calculation is a new column, right? Like, for example, let's do this. I'm going to click on the plus sign, and I'm going to click on calculation, and I'm going to name it as discounted cost. And what I'm going to do is, Let's set it equal to, and now I have to select my column that I want to use it. And my column is going to be the cost. Okay. I'm going to type in here, student cost. And I'm going to subtract 1,000. Well, just suppose that Yelan is nice and I'm making a discount. And I'm going to click on done, right? There we go. So what this will do is it will add a new column. This is called a column, not field, but column, okay? So at the end, it will be added. And I can keep on adding the calculations. Uh, when I add a new calculation, I can use the existing calculation, or I can use the functions, right, here, or I can use other columns. Now, notice that there is no data quality score for the calculated column, right? And this is how I named it. Now, something else that I could do is data groups. Let's see if it's on our next slide. Okay, this is a calculation. This is a data group. Uh, now, uh, keep in mind that I use a bold font intentionally. Okay, I use a bold font intentionally on some of the slides. All right, so let's do this. We can click on here. And I'm going to click on the data group. Basically, sometimes I want to look at the value ranges, right? And I'm going to select the new field, right? I'm going to select a new field. Uh, for some reason, by default, it selected the first one. So let's close it. Let's close it. I don't like what it did. Uh, what you could do is you could click on a field that you want to use for the groupings 
directly, right? You can use, you can, you can click on the field that you want to use directly, like overall GPA. Oops, come on, close. I want to click on the overall GPA column headings, heading, and then I want to uh, create my data group like this. Is this it is also called the binning. When a variable is numeric, I can, uh, instead of looking at the GPA uh, actual value, I can say, for instance, 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, something along this line, right? I'm a little bit stuck. Sometimes we have to be a little bit patient. And at this point, if I use the back button, I would have made the situation worse. So now, I click on overall GPA. I click on this ellipsis. Yes, does anybody have a question? Please put your question in the chat, okay? Please put your question in the chat. Don't hesitate. So here, I click on the ellipsis, and then I can select the data group from here. Yes? So if you raise your hand, please type your question in the chat. Do me a favor. <laughs> okay? Type your question in the chat. So click here. Let me see that if it will do it. And I'm going to do edit data group. Right? And now I'm going to select my column. It's a little bit slow. It's a little bit slow today. It, it has to do with the fact of me... Yeah, Okay, so take a look at what I will do. Let me type in GPA over here. Let's see if it's going to give me my GPA column. Oops. It still wants to do the state. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to use a totally new, I'm trying to use a different column. And for some unknown reason, it would not let me click on a column directly. Usually it does. Let me close this out again. Guys, sorry, sometimes that, that's what it is. We have to deal with it. In the worst case scenario, I would switch to my admin like account and uh, go from there. Okay, I'm going I'm going to do this. I, I scroll down and I'm going to select the overall GPA. I selected it here. So now it's supposed to, what I expect to see is that I expect it to show me this range is this group like this here. Well, it happens. Okay, there we go. Now, here is the point here. When I create a data group, I create a new column. I have to name the column. I have to enter the column name in here in this text box. Okay? Here, by default, it's dividing the data into equal ranges right i can override it i can i can i can override it right if i wanted to okay so let's just let's just accept this as is okay i can override it i i can change to set up the boundaries of my range or i can accept the default that it gave me right so that was for the the uh Numeric column. I can add also groups. I can also add groups for the categorical column. And for the categorical, perhaps I'm going to select county, right? And the grouping for categorical columns allows me uh, combining the sets of values. Like in the county example, perhaps I want to uh, combine several counties into a region. See, this, this is my county. And I'm going to create a new variable. I'm going to call it region, right? And unlike for the um, numeric variable, for categorical variable, I do not have the default groups. The groups are not created for me by default. I must create the groups manually by clicking on new group and then entering entering the... Uh, I have to enter the, the group name. So I have region 1. I'm going to click here. I'm going to uh, type region 2. Right? So basically, this is the main difference. When I have a categorical variable, I have to define, I have to physically define my bins. Right? The number of bins is not predefined for me. I have to define it. Right? So I define three bins. Right? This is region. And now what I have to do is this. I have to uh, drag and drop, right? 
So this is a group, this is a group that I selected, and then I just do this. And doing that should add values to this group. I just I can just do double click like this. Right? So now I selected the next region and I do this. But what you see here in the left panel is the list of all counties. Okay, you see the list of all counties. Okay. So there we go. Now it looks like now it's running. Another thing to consider is your uh, laptop. What's currently running on your laptop? Apparently, um, I had some other stuff going that was slowing down. Okay. Now, what's going to happen right now is that, notice that I did not add all values, right? So I'm going to click on Done. And you will see that I will have a new column added at the very end. I have a new column added at the very end, and the column is called region. And now, if you will see that, uh, my data, it will look like my data has missing values. It's because I did not place some of these in the groups. I did not place some of the values in the groups. So, uh, to complete this, I would have to return to my, uh, I would have to return to my uh, groupings and keep it going, right? So, it's a little bit slow. Okay, here it is. Now, when I click on region, and I click here, and I and I should be able to go back to my uh, groups. Oops. Here it is. See this? I could go back to this properties. This is how I go back. Now, I click on properties, and then I'll have an option to return. In the properties, there will be an option to return to groupings. And that's what I would do, basically, right? So, but what I did was, I summarized it for you. The binning for, for the, the numeric variable, for continuous variables are predefined. The binning for categorical are not. Here, you, you may change the number of bins and cu customize the bin size. For the categorical variables, you must specify the bin name. You must uh, physically define the bins, and you must drag and drop the values in bins, right? And also, there is such a concept called hierarchy, right? So let's see if it's finished. Here it is, right? So in the, in order to return, see this? This is what I wanted to show you. You can click on Edit Data Group. Edit Data Group to return to this screen. And then you can continue editing, right? Well, this is very tricky because I honestly have to just poke around to find how to return to this view, right? To return this data group screen. So this is not obvious. Okay, let me click on done. I, and basically, another thing I wanted to mention that whenever when your data is being uploaded, Watson is trying to find the relationships, including the hierarchy. It will make more sense when we start analyzing the data. But uh, this is an example here. Uh, it, it might not be applicable to this specific data, but in some data sets, you could have a country and you can have a state. So hierarchy allows you to drill down. I could have data uh, displayed by country, and I could drill down to see the data by state. And then I could further drill down to see the data by uh, region. So uh, somehow, uh, Watson Analytics tracks, and when I specify the state, it knows what country I am in, right? It tracks the geographical locations. Another example of the hierarchy in data could be the year, uh, month within a year, and date within a month, right? And this is very useful for the drill down. And you can also define your custom hierarchies. Remember, you can always define your custom hierarchies. Uh, now, here, I put this to make sure that you remember you cannot undo the deletion. The deletion cannot be undone. There is no recycle bin. Okay? So, now, let's let's move on. Let me exit this. And I'm not going to save my changes. Well, usually, oh, yeah, to save your changes, at the top, you have a save button, right? At the very top, there was a save button. That's how you would do the save changes. Oops. 
actually let me do this let me cancel it okay let's do this card okay let's do this card here we go okay in general it, let me do this i have to zoom okay it's because i am I, I can adjust my zoom to 100 if i adjust my zoom to 100 these buttons will appear at the top okay and what the buttons let me to do what the button left me to let me to do this one is safe right when i click on this see this oops when i click on the arrow the arrow opens up the option save save us and, and reset uh when i click when i just tap on this button by default it selects the first option in the drop down which is safe right it's now saving uh, this little asterisk next to the file name indicates that the file was not saved after the last change was made. Okay, so it's saving right now. While it's saving, let's sh let me show you this. Uh, at the when you are at the landing page, you notice that there is a little bar where you can type your question in. Okay, we are done right now. So let's go back to the landing page. Oh. Now to go back to the, to go back to the landing page, you just click on this. You can click on this logo, button analytics logo. Here is a place where I can type in my questions. Right? What is um actor for risk? Right? I can type this. When I do this, when I type my question in here, um, an application will attempt to search all the data sets that I have access to and try to answer my question, right? What is a factor for risk? So what it did was it now searched all the data sets that I have access to. For instance, uh, I might be interested in what drives the risk, what drives the risk of student academic bad academic performance or it could be looking at the it could say that I want to see the decision tree for risk or it might think that there is another data set I have that tracks the bank loss events maybe it, it's saying that I want to look at the risk right for that data set so here basically I see the data set name and possibly my answer to the question, the visualization that could answer my question that I typed in. I can type this question on the data screen, and I can also type the same question on this screen, right? I can type the question on this screen right here. And this will search all data sets for my answer, right? Remember this. It will search all data sets. Alternatively, if I do this, if I click on this, and if I type what drives risk, I'm only searching this data set. I'm only searching this specific data set. It's because I clicked on this data set. And now I can click here, and this will build the new discovery workbook. And this is this is called the spiral this is spiral visualization. Oh, it's because it's because I clicked on a tour. That's why it's showing me now what each a page, what each part of the page shows, right? So it showed me that right now my target variable is risk. Target is a variable that I want to predict, and in this case, I want to look at which factors determine if my student is at risk of the academic failure. Okay. Uh, and I can keep on scroll going through this, and it will show me different uh, information about different parts of the screen. Uh, right now, it's building the visualization. What I see here in the, in the right panel is a set of related uh, visualizations that I could be interested in. Right? It's showing me related visualizations that I could be interested in in this panel. Right? So it's a smart application. Okay. Oh. Okay, here, this is a list of factors. This is a list of factors that could determine if my student is an academic uh, risk. And notice this, guess what it is? Absences, right? 
So the number of times the student is absent from the class determines if a student is at risk of academic failure, right? Uh, the, the predictions, the predictor strength is uh, over 80%, right? This is how good my uh, predictor is. Uh, I could click on a plus sign here. This is what just happened. I clicked on the plus sign and doing so <coughs> opens up the new tab. And this opens up the new tab and I can see more details. Number of absences. And this is a proportion of the student at the risk of academic uh, failure based on the number of absences. So the students are more likely to be at risk if they missed four courses, right? So in the online environment, I think missing four courses is not participating in discussion four times. Uh, what I could also do here is this. Watch gender. I could put gender into multiply slot. When I do that, I'm going to see the separate visualization for gender, right? I'm going to see the separate visualization for gender. So now I could say, hey, does gender have an impact on a, on a student academic performance? So we know the number of absences, right? And, and, and we know, uh, see here, we know the number of absences, we know the number of gender. Does gender make a difference? Well, of course not. But this is this is something that you could look at in your paper, right? Something to look at. Uh, so now, if you look at this, this is the bull's eye. Each of these risk factors here is represented as, as a pin, and the closer the pin to the core, the more stronger the predictor is. And I can hover over the pin to see the information about this driver. What? All right, what I could also do is uh, I could, to see a new visualization, I could either select anything from this here. I, I can select any visualization here, or I could just click on the new here. That would add a new tab. And then I will have an option to pick visualizations that I want to do. But before we do that, uh, you should be able to click on this here and you should be able to use a descriptive name. Let me see, let me name it risk drivers. And I'm doing it for a reason. It's because I want to know, I want to know what I have been doing. That will help me later on when I build my visualizations. When I build my presentation rather, sorry. And now I'm gonna click on this. I, I want to rename this too. Okay, rename. And I'm going to do this. Let's do risk by absences by gender. Okay? Okay, now I'm going to go here. I'm going to close this because, because, because I don't want to. Uh, this is not what I wanted to do. So let me click on this plus sign. And I want to show you decision tree. We really have to know it for the test. You really have to know decision trees. Uh, okay, now what I want to do is I want to predict, uh, I want to see the predictive factors for the risk. I can do the, just this, and it's going to give me decision tree as one of the options, and I want to build the decision tree model for the risk. Now, uh, you will revisit the decision trees for your assignment three, and you'll have to build one where the target variable that you're predicting is categorical and where the target variable is numeric. Right now I'm looking at the categorical and the way you read it is that here this is the profiles of people who uh, are not at risk. So people uh, who missed uh, one or less uh, sessions and these are the conditions they're a member of at least one club and they did not feel sick at all, and they uh, didn't take any AP exams, perhaps, right? So we have 754 people that fall under this category, and 100% of them are not at risk, right? Not at risk, is a green. And I keep on going down, those are the profiles of people who are more likely not at risk, and this is it ordered. So now the chances of dropping, right? 
there we go ultimately ultimately i can do i can i can look at the at risk i can look at at risk so here it is people who missed more more than four sessions they're likely at risk and there are 56 people that fall under this category so this is this is how you read these rules and what you could also do is you can toggle between the the decision rules and decision tree the decision tree is basically a model and uh, you have to this is a little bit tricky because you have to zoom in you have to be able to zoom in to see the actual uh, picture of a tree you read the tree from left to right and uh, here the first node this is a parent node stands for all records here is a split and it's going it's going to make a split on the absences as the first uh, branch this is on the absences and it's going to check what is my number of absences and depending on the number of absences it t takes a certain uh, pass right it goes to the next node depending on the number of absences so if number of absences more than four I have reached this node this is a leaf node because uh, there are no more nodes that emanate from it if I fall under here it, it's looking it's looking at the next uh, variable and this one is club membership she says I can hover and it's going to show me the name and if I hover here it's going to show me uh, the dominant in this case it's going to show me the dominant category that's what it does I could also click on the light bulb if I wanted to see not only the dominant but I wanted to see uh, all categories well in this specific case I only have two values right it was a, a risk or not a risk but sometimes you could have the categorical variable with more than one value you could have this more than one value right uh, there is something that I put together for you on the slides and uh, what I want you to do is right now remember that it exists for the next assignment I want you to go back to the slide here what basically it does is I'm going to look at how many students are actually at risk of academic failure and how many students are predicted to be at risk of academic failure and I'm going to do this plot, this chart here. This is uh, called classification table, or also it can be called com confusion matrix. So here I'm trying to say I have 356 students who are at risk, and I predicted they are at risk, right? So this is a uh, true positive. I have uh, about uh, 178 students who I uh, predicted they are at risk, but they're not. Here is a number of students who are not at risk, and I predicted not at risk, and they're not at risk. And here, this is a number of students that are not at risk, but, well, I predicted they're not at risk, but they're actually at risk. And to calculate the accuracy of my model, I would have to take the numbers on the diagonal, right, and divide by the total. Well, the reason it's on the diagonal, because this is the predicted value as much as the actual outcome. These two guys match, right? So 356 plus 3,536. This is the number of correct predictions. And over here, it shows me which are variables in the data set are important. So this is first, it took the absences, and it's doing on the binion, right? It's splitting based on number of absences. Then it took the informer visit, and then it took the club membership, right? So this is basically telling me which variables are important. So now I'm doing it for the uh, categorical variable. For the for the continuous variable, it looks di differently. You're going to be looking at the um, rather an average. You're going to be looking at an averages, right? And what I did was I have a uh, picture in the slides right and I want to show you if you have time left but let me let me just show you an example this is what's going to happen for the uh, this is an example student GPA and this is what will happen when you have the variable numeric here on this slide um, instead of showing the actual uh, class where a student is at risk or not I'm showing the other uh, average student GPA so, 
So basically, here this is average. Uh, so bas ba basically, what I'm looking at is this. This is the number of students, and here is a description of the number of students in question, and that's our average GPA. Something like this, right? This is how it's going to work for numeric variable. And you're going to have the leaf node is going to have a different color code. Darker color code is going to stand for higher GPA. Lighter color code is going to stand for the lower GPA. This is how it looks like for numeric variables, like this, right? And then when I hover on my leaf node, I'm going to see the average GPA and I'm going to see the standard deviation instead of this. See here, when I hover, I can see which category dominates. I can see the dominant category right now. Okay, so this is the main difference. And what I also have to do is I have to save my work. And let me save it as, oops, what happened? Oh, yeah, it's because I minimized this. Okay, so let's do that. And I'm going to click here, and I'm going to do save as. And I'm going to do the, now it's going to prompt me for the file name, and I want to use a descriptive. I'm going to say, uh, find, I'm going to say, what do you want to say? Uh, right, okay, and I'm going to click on save right now. And what, what I'll do now, I'm going to go back to my landing page. Okay, here it is. See that this is what's going to happen for numeric variable. Okay, and this is categorical. I just put together the slides for you, so that way you can after this class you can go back and look at it. Okay, and and also this is where you I looked at the confusion matrix. I I looked at, I clicked on this analysis. Uh, you could also do some uh, changing colors. You can do the for every visualization, you have an option to change colors and so on. Oops. I don't want to be logged in as an admin. Let's go back as a user. Here it is. Look at this. This is another option here. I'm going to click on Format. And the Formatting options allow changing fonts and so on. So just remember that, that I have this option. I can show hide the title. Or I can just change my colors here. I have options to do that. Just something to keep in mind. All right. Okay, so let's just close this out. And let's go back to the landing page. This will take me to the landing page. Remember, when I click here, it shows me what I have open. Right now, I have this uh, discovery workbook. And I have this data set open right now. So let me close this. Okay, we're going to move on, and here I just wrote more than what you could do, zoom in, zoom out, and so on. Then here, these are important numbers. Uh, don't worry about the numbers for this test, but you have to worry about these numbers for your assignment three. You have to worry about these numbers for your assignment three. Okay. Uh, here, now we're going to do, we're going to create the display. Display is a way to... Uh, show our to show our findings, right? Just imagine that your instructor is your manager, and you're going to uh, present the findings of your study. So this is what I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna click on the display, right? Let me click on the got it to close this pop up. Okay, so now what I'll do? I'm gonna click on new display. I promise that I'm gonna show you. We're going to have another class on the Watson Analytics. And I'll show you the infographics when we have a next class. For right now, let's just, let's just uh, stick with the dashboard. And I'm going to name it as student findings, right? Student findings. Okay, now this is what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this and I'm going to click on create. I have, I have an option for the layout and I'm going to select this. Right, I'm going to do this. Ooh, come on. <laughs> I see that's oh, end tour. Excellent. So now it's gonna end. Good. So now what I'm gonna do is I can.
add my existing visualization or, or I can create the new visualization on the fly. Uh, I can show you both. I have to show you both. So now let me do this. Let me go to personal. And this is what I just did, right? Student, student findings that I just created. Uh, my uh, workbook has three tabs. To see the tabs, I click on the arrow, and it allows me to expand this. Uh, right now, watch what I'm going to do is, I'll take this, I drag and drop, but look, I want to keep my mouse on top of this arrow. It's because I want my visualization to occupy this entire space, right? This is what I wanted to do now. Uh, now I'm going to add more. I'm going to add one here, and I'm going to add another one over here. And what I'm going to do now is oops, this, right? Now I'm going to add another tab. It's because I have to illustrate, I have to show you how the filter works. I, mu I must show you that this is important. Okay, so this is one tab. Now I'm going to add a second tab here. Okay, and I'm going to do just one. And this time I'm going to create a new discovery. And, well, the reason I want to select map, because I want to show you something, how the filters work. And this is much easier to illustrate when I use the map. Okay, let's do this. Because it's much easier to illustrate this if I use the map. Okay, here it is, right? So I have my data for every single county, right? I just just imagine it. I have some data for every single county. That's what it's showing me now. I'm going to minimize this, right? Uh, remember that when you click on this, when you click on this, this is called the focus mode, right? When you click on this, you're taking it the visualization in a focus mode. And while you're in a focus mode, you can edit the format, and you can also define the filters. See this? This is a data tray. This is similar to your refined interface. And what you could do, you could just uh, refine your data here. You can, you can just refine, but if you add the filter here, it will apply only to this specific visualization, right? This data tray, you also had it in a discovery workbook. But if you define the filter in a discovery workbook, it will apply only to the discovery. If I apply the filter in a re refined interface, that will apply to all visualizations that I create from that. Uh, it will apply to all visualizations that I create. Now, for some reason, it's not, it's not no longer showing me the whole map it was. Okay, it was showing me the whole map a while ago. That, that's what I want to see. Okay. Uh, oh, I see what's going on. Do you know what's going on? It's showing me just the county that I selected. What I have to do, watch, watch. Currently, I accidentally selected a specific county. This is called the highlighting. When I clear the highlighting, I should see the whole data again. I should see the whole data again. I just click on clear. Anyhow, uh, what I was trying to show you here is that is the filtering. That's the reason I picked them up. I wanted to show you how the filtering works. If I uh, add, I can add the filter to the single top or I can add the filter to all tops, right? If I define the filter to a sing single top, it will filter the data only that I have on this top. It will not filter the data that I have on the second top. Right? But on the other hand, if I uh, do, on the other hand, if I do this, this filter here, all tops, it will filter data for all tops. Like for example, if I'm on this page and if I add a filter to see students in a specific country, it will affect both tops. Right? So here it is. I want to click on the filter, and then I'm going to see the list of available fields, and this is a county. I can drag and drop county here, and then I can just click here, and I can select. I can select my county. 
from here that I want to uh, edit filter values and then I have to I can select this for instance right all tabs I want to see this three county right and this is what's gonna happen so now when I click on this top, the data should be, the filter should be applicable to both tops. Well, anyways, there are several ways to define the filter. Well, for some reason, somehow, I may have done something to limit the data further. But just remember, oh, yeah, 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 I see, I see. It, I, I see what's going on. Okay. All right. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that it remembers that if I'm on the first tab, if I define the filter across all tabs, the filter will be applicable to data on both tabs. If I'm on this tab, right, if I define the filter, the filter will be applicable only on the, on the, on the data to this tab. Ah, yeah, I have it in here. I have it on my admin account. I have this discovery, oops, I, I have this display in my ad admin account, it just happened this way. Uh, I have it on my admin account, so let me go back here, and this is a display, display I'm referring to, oops, here it is. So, this is a academic performance display. This is I created that for for another demo, right? This is just different visualizations that you can create. Uh, let me close it. Let me close this out. Anyhow, uh, just remember that. Just remember that that if you define the filter on one top, it will only affect that top. If you define, you 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 can also define the filter for that will affect both both stops right it could be this one. Oh, there we go take a look at this i have my counties in here right here i'm going to have all counties see this i'm doing a student cost by county here another tab i have other visualizations by county right I can go ahead and define, see this? I defined the filter on a county in here. See this? Watch. I added the county filter only to this tab, right? The second tab. When I go to my county tab, I still see all the counties. Why? It's because the filter that I added is only on this second tab, right? The filter that I added right now it is applicable only to the second tab. So remember that for the test, there are three ways to add a filter. One way, all tabs, another way, single tab, another way, you would, could go to the visualization, take it in the focus mode, and define the filter. Okay? I'm looking at my workbook right now. At the moment, it's not editable, because I'm looking at it in a view mode. To switch between the view and edit mode, you can click on a pencil mark. When you click on a pencil mark, your workbook becomes editable, okay? Or when you click on the glasses, your workbook becomes not editable again, right? So I guess you got the idea, right? So, Elena is famous for walkarounds, right? Okay. Now, uh, we're going to go back to the slides. Uh, here, I'm just illustrating something else that you could do, right? This may sound easy, but you remember that you can add text, image, and media link and widgets to your storybook. When you, I mean, to your display. When you, when you create a display, you may add images, right? Like, for example, see this? That's what I'm referring to. I can do this. This is the, the text, right? I can add my text, something like this, and I can just enter it. I can just enter something like this, right? I just entered my name. Well, well, it's just a dummy example, but I can, I can, I just show you that you can add text, right? Text, image, media, link, and widgets. This can be added. 
right? So now, uh, there we go. You can add an existing display or you can create a brand new, right? And the existing displays that you add, it could be it could be located in your uh, personal area or it could be in a shared. Okay, we'll talk about shared later in the course. Another thing that you want to remember is that this is an example here of another pie chart visualization. Pie chart the visualizations can be customized. Okay, you can if you want customize the visualization. That includes changing the background, adding the variation to the pie chart, and so on. Uh, just also something else to remember that if you filter visualization by the column, that column does not have to be part of the visualization. Okay. For example, I can filter my column. I can filter my data by county, but county does not necessarily have to be part of the plot itself. Right. Uh, this is the top toolbar. Uh, what you want to know is that sharing. Over here, uh, there is an option to share. This one. Oops. Ooh. See this? Here. Share allows me to share my data. Uh, by, by default, I have three options on. Email by default is not on. It's download and tweet is on by default. But for... Oof. To be able to use an email, you have to turn it on. And in this slide, I put how to turn it on. Uh, you have to click on this user, right? This user appears everywhere on each pages, on each page. Uh, the reason I have to use my uh, account with the same privileges that you do, because I want you to see your view. I don't want you to see the admin view right now. Uh, when you click on account settings, this is what you will see. This is the total space used by everybody on a subscription. So I don't want you to worry about the space. We have plenty of space. Okay. So here it is. Uh, you have to set this to yes. If you want to be able to uh, em share your files via emails. Well, but the email recipient has to be... Uh, another student on this account. Just, just remember that, okay? Well, they call it tenant, another user on this account. In this case, it's a student. Okay? So now let's go back. This shows me the options that you have on a, on a, on a, on a landing page. Oops. Okay, here it is. Now I'm going to go back to my landing page. Oh! Aha, uh -huh. I did not save my display. Okay, good, it's still open, right? I'm going to go here right now to my student findings. And it is paramount that I save the work. Otherwise, it's too bad. I'm going to lose what I did, and there is no way to restore it. So to just save, I have to click here, and it will save it. Okay, now... Uh, very important, please save everything to your personal folder for right now. Do not attempt to save anything to the shared. Oh, it already exists? Okay. Let's do that, save. Okay, well, maybe, maybe the page was not refreshed. Okay, there we go. Now, take a look at this. Do you see this? Do you see this? This added the style, right? And when I click here, I have an option to rename, move, and delete. There is no recycle bin. When you delete something, it's gone forever. Move will be useful later. Well, what I could do is this. I could uh, select my personal. I could create a new folder here. And I could call this assignment 2, right? It's because you're going to have several assignments. And sometimes... You want to create a separate subfolder for each assignment. And then you can do this. You can do move. And then you... Oh. Aha! I did it intentionally. Do you see why? Do you see why I cannot move the file? Because it's still open. So whenever you want to move the file to the subfolder, you have to close it first. Right? And the file is open if you see it here. 
And also, if you see an asterisk next to the file name, it means you have not saved the latest change. <laughs> okay? So now what you will do, now it should work. Move, and then I select assignment 2. Okay, move. There we go. Okay, so now, now remember that before you move the file to the subfolder, you have to close the file. It's just how it works. The file must be closed. Another thing is that there are dependencies between these guys right here and this data right here. If I delete my data set that I used to create this guy, this guy will become invalid. Even if I upload another copy of the data set with the same name, I cannot fix it. There is no way in the world to fix it. If I delete this data, I'm repeating it, if I delete this data that I used to build this discovery, this discovery will be damaged permanently. There is no way to recover it, okay? Just keep that in mind, okay? Well, it's a sad story. Uh, somebody deleted something that could not be restored, and it happened on the day when assignment was due. It's this is a sad and true story, so I don't want uh, to be you, the main character in that story, okay? So let's see what else we have to cover. Aha! This is a rule. <laughs> this is a problem. Because uh, we're sharing the system between what? You just saw how many users we had, right? We have more than 500 users in a system, right? If you scroll down, 543 active users right now. So it means that we have certain rules. Right, we have certain rules, and one of the rules is that we're going to be saving all our work to our personal area, because anything that's saved to the root of shared folder is visible to everybody in the system. We don't know whose work it is. Anybody can open it and modify it. Anybody can delete it, and so on. So Elena did some some thought about it, and. Uh, what's going to happen is that anything that's saved in the wrong place, just to benefit everybody, Elena is going to go to her admin account, and Elena has a folder. Elena has a folder that she calls Trash. And anything that's saved in the wrong location will end up in this Trash folder that Elena has, right? Anything that was saved in the wrong location ends up in this folder and you will need to contact me. I've been doing it for the students benefit and a lot of you are going to tell me thank you at some point. It's because you don't want somebody else to override your work, right? So I'm going to be monitoring everything that's going on and I'm, I, I'm here to help you. So it, it's not to, to punish anybody, it's to help you. And you will see many reasons. So now uh, this is a bonus part for people who stayed through the end and, and listened. Uh, uh, this one, this one, oops, the, the, the thing here is a set of links, and they're going to have a copy of this presentation after this class. I put together these links. What's an analytics community, online documentation, there is a set of nice videos, and a learning center, right? And here are some links to the nice case study. Well, are you guys excited about the upcoming fi fi fireworks on the 4th of July, right? You might be interested to read this uh, case study about the fireworks sale, perhaps, right? Or if you are the in sales industry, you can read about the holiday sales planning. Or you can read about the sales, uh, I'm sorry, about the traffic in Manhattan. And there are some more used cases. Right. So that's basically what it is. And now I guess I want you guys to ask questions. I love questions. If you are interested, I could show you decision tree for numeric variables. Let me know. Just let me know what you want me to show you. This is customer service. Yes. Which data set should you use for your assignment? Excellent. Okay. Let me, let me explain it. And I also put together a video about it. Okay, so let me see. Let me take a look at the chart. Okay, I will show you with data set is with data limits, 
Well, okay. Uh, this is an excellent question. Max number of columns, maximum number of rows. I don't remember it from the top of my head, but uh, he wants to be reasonable. You're not going to upload the terabytes in here. Probably megabyte is reasonable, right? Uh, probably um, 5,000 rows makes sense. I would say uh, 15 columns makes sense. But this is what I did for you. And, guys, I put together a nice video that I want you to watch. This will save you a lot of time. Take a look here. Watch. This is a shared area. I click on the plus sign. Then I click on more data sets. I have to select the data tile. This is a data set for you, guys. So you can look at this. Right? You can use this. Why not? Huh? And you can ask me, and I can show you the data set description file. Oh, excellent, excellent. Yes, and 1,000 by 15 works too. Uh, I think in your, in your assignment requirement, it says more than 1,000. Something like that. I would have to look at the specific, specific assignment, yes. But, but, I mean, 2,000 is fine too, I think. But this is a really good one. Mobile price classification so you are basically uh, predicting the price range of the phone based on the phone characteristics such as camera and so on all right so this is in a shared folder and you have a view only a uh, permission so what you need to do here is this look you're gonna click on you're gonna you're going to do a click on ellipsis you're gonna click on refine right so okay and you're going to save a copy to your area, okay? Let me close the chat window for now. <laughs> okay, so what you're going to do is, you saw this saver thing, right? And you watch the video where I show you the step-by-step. -step. So you have to click on this arrow, and you select savers option, and you save a copy of this data to your uh, area. You save a copy of this data set to your personal area. Uh, in, the, in, in the classroom, you will see, you will find the recording on this. This is a set of, uh, there are like at least 50 data sets that I put for you. Okay, so let me look at the chat. Look at the chat. Oh, okay, sure, sure. I'm glad I answered your question, yes. But in general, this is a good one. This is an excellent one, okay? Well, it's looking at whether the font has a touch screen, and then there, if it's, uh, it, you're looking at the, here, this is a target variable. You want to predict the price range, and it's looking if you have a Wi-Fi, right? If it has a front camera, and, and you're looking at the memory, you're looking at the clock speed, and so on, right? So if you were doing, if you were predicting the categorical variable, you probably want to predict the um, price range, right? Price category. If you are doing uh, the numeric variable, well, you have several options here. You can you can predict this this one the clocks the uh, mobile weight or perhaps you can predict RAM. RAM makes sense actually, right? RAM really makes sense for that one. Yeah, but you want to look at the, at the data set. This data set is from Kaggle. Yeah, and I can provide the source for your instructors if you're interested in a specific data set I can provide where I downloaded it from. So this is a very good one. I recommend this one, especially for assignment three, probably. Okay. So basically, I did some uh, homework for you and found nice data sets. Okay. Okay. So I want you guys to take a look at that. Just, just poke around and see what you like. There are different topics here like a crime rate prediction and uh, so on right and then there is one that uh tells well the reasons people don't show to the you want to predict if whether the uh, patient will show to the doctor appointment well there are different different topics topics in here let's say or you can predict the price of a laptop so there are a bunch of interesting interesting stuff Right. So I hope I answered the questions. Did I? And I would like to see more questions. Let me take a look at the chat because I have the chat window 
closed while I was taking care of the questions. Okay. Yeah, but this is, I have excellent questions about the file limit, yes. Okay. Any more questions? Well, I have questions to you guys. How many lines of code did I write tonight? Anybody? <laughs> did I write none? Excellent. So that's the whole point. We we are going to save the code writing fund for the next course. Save it for 620, 6.30, right? Save the best for the last, right? Well, no, but see, that's how you start exploring the data. Yes, excellent. Yes, you're going to use Python in the next class, 620. That's right. But uh, for this course, you're going to just, well, usually when you get data, you want to do some initial exploration before you start the coding, right? Because you have to know what to code, what to look for. So that's what basically the main purpose is. And also the natural language questions, right? So guys, promise me that you're going to do the following. After this, you're going to check if you received an invitation email and you're going to accept it. Right? That's your plan. You're going to, to watch the video uh, that I recorded on uh, how what to do for the Watson Analytics 101 course. And you're going to take the course. You're going to watch the video on the data sets too because I uploaded the data sets for the, uh, for the 101, Watson 101 course libraries that are here. So you don't need to worry about downloading them and uploading them. You can go straight and save the copy to your personal area. If that works for you, you know, it's much, maybe it's easier. So I, I, I'm giving you a bunch of options here. All right. So do we have more questions? And we're going to have another class on more advanced, on storybooks and more advanced visualizations. It's about in four weeks. Okay. Steve, is there anything you would like to add? No, I think you've actually uh, enhanced your presentation here. Can you, uh, so you've had a lot of extras. The key is, as we have found out over the years, of course, the key is to practice, practice, practice. Get in, try things, try things, experiment. You're not going to always learn it right away, so try things. The more time you can spend with it, the more you'll come to love Watson Analytics. All right, let me go ahead and stop the recording, mm -hmm. and I will send the link.